So we played Let's Make a Deal um, that Thursday before. Uh, ooh, let me get my let me get my laptop that has the that has the stats on it. Excuse me. Um, we played Let's Make a Deal, right? Some of you won. Some of you took the deal. Okay. And um, some of you lost. Okay. Pour one out for the homies on the ones who lost. Uh, there was a correct answer on the quiz, and it is switching. I'll tell you why and as we investigate these slides. Um, but I do want to bring up the stats on how many people won and how many people lost from my spreadsheet here. Okay. So. Those who switched um, won. Everyone who switched and stayed for the grand prize won. Okay. Now, the funny thing is, is that that's only two. That was only two of the uh, 17 people that participated. Two. Okay. Um, because the vast majority of the late gamers ended up taking the quiz points. Um, oh, actually, I need to put those quiz points in. Sorry. So for those of you who got the four points on quiz two or other point values, I need to go put those in. So, sorry about that. I forgot, I for, I for, forgot that one. So, um, one, two, three, four, five, six people will see their scores, um, skyrocket. Okay, so, um, and those, that bonus percentage does factor into your final, final grade. So th that is significant. Um, that is significant. And that stacks with the improvement percentage. But what will likely happen is that your uh, improvement percentage won't, that extra credit probably won't carry over to quiz three. If you want a breakdown of what I mean by that, go to the syllabus and uh, page four, the benefit of the doubt policy. Um, okay. And for those that stayed, one person won. Okay, one person who stayed won. Okay. Um, but then everyone who, oh no, sorry. Two people stayed w who won. Um, but everyone else who stayed lost. And the people that that dealed out that th the the quiz percentages also lost. And so, if those people had decided to stay, they would have lost. Um. So, it's a small sample size, and we talked about uh, a few back at the end of February, I think it was, um, how small sample sizes, the law of small, small numbers is a big bias. So this 17 participant list, not a very good representative, representative sample of the correct answer, which is to switch. And so if you looked up the Monty Hall problem afterward, you would have seen that the, the best idea was to switch. And I have a, a, a Mythbusters videos that, that, that shows how this works when you expand your sample size to a hundred or even more, um, which is how the problem works. Because the larger, the the the, the bigger the the sample size gets, the better um, your chances are. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, so I haven't put that in. So in Brightspace, you'll if you took the deal, if you played and you took the deal, um, you will see a, a boost in your score after class. I, um, I haven't put that in. So some at some point this afternoon, I, I, I will need to do that. I for, forgot about this extra credit when I was grading the quizzes yesterday. Um, so even though we tied two stays one, two switches one, the bigger point is how many total stays 
and the winner. So what? how many wins in the numerator, how many overall stays in the numerator, so, or denominator, excuse me. So switches two for two, okay? Two over two. Um, for stays, we have one, two, three, nine two for nine two for nine stay two for nine so if we're if we, even with our small sample size again it's biased even with that small sample size we can say huh uh it appears that switching is better so let's look at this from a bigger perspective what the uh what what the math slash monty hall problem has to say about it and so uh but before we get started hey why not uh let's just, just uh, watch some office yeah i don't know why i put parkour in here but you know <clears throat> all right so let's 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 watch uh the monty hall problem explained so this is a breakdown um from asap uh uh, ASAP science um, about the statistics of the Monty Hall problem. And then I believe I have, oh no, wait, now I got rid of the, um, uh, I think I got rid of the Miss Butters one because this one's a little bit shorter. Uh, we'll watch this one. Um, I am ugly. Oh. All right, so that's how it works. Um, and uh, the, uh, you can also go watch Vsauce. Look at you know uh, Vsauce, and and he'll explain the same thing. Mythbusters did this. They did a hundred trials each, where um, Jamie was only allowed to stay, and um, uh, Adam was only allowed to switch. And when they went through the the a hundred trials each, they found that it was roughly. Um, Two thirds to one third, sixty-seven uh, percent winnings for Adam, thirty-three-ish percent winnings for Jamie, um, and that was just with a hundred trials. Consider how many people went and did that um, during the time of Let's Make a Deal, and you know the game's still around. Uh, Wayne Brady hosts it now. Um, it's got the, essentially the same concept, so. Um, you know, oh, sorry, over there. There you, there you go. That's the Monty Hall problem. Okay. And it has to do, so the, and, and so this is why I use this one to bleed into the, um, you know, next, oh God, this is gigantic. Can I make this smaller? Um, so go ahead and, um, same as before, use your computer since you're on it. Or use your phone. Um, so basically, I gotta be smallest. Okay, and um, show me what you uh, some, show me what you got from the uh, um, it's better to stick with your first impulse than go back to change multiple chest multiple choice test answers. I'm sure this has plagued you for many years, some of you. Uh, um, so if you're unsure by now, the claims are all myths. <laughs> and so claims six, seven, and eight will all be myths. Um, just FYI. However, this one, this particular one, is really uh, intransigent. People believe this one, um, the same for the same reasons that they believe sticking with their first choice on the Monty Hall problem is the right way to go. Okay, for the same reasons. Okay, um, and we're gonna go through those reasons after we um, throw this in. False. Okay, yep, right, sure. Mm -hmm. It's better to switch. 
Mm-hmm. First state, yeah. Oh, yep, yep, yep. I like that one. Connection with ego. Mm -hmm. I like that one. Depending on confidence level. Yep, confidence has a ton to do with it. Okay, change your answers, then stick with your first impulse. Yeah. Myth. Mm -hmm. Better to change your answer, for sure. People are too conservative to change their answers. Fear of failure. Okay, better chance of winning or or getting the right answer on a multiple choice test. But yeah, I feel you on that one. It's better to change your answer. Yep, instinct isn't always right. Right. Fear of failures. <laughs> you should switch your answer. Switch How many of you switch your answers? I don't think very many of you take this advice. Or maybe you learned something while, do, while investigating this. Maybe you thought intuition was better. I know it's not an aspect that you need for this class, but many of your other classes, even even you know before you started college in high school, you did all that Illinois state testing. No, that was all multiple choice. So, yeah, there's a regret there. Taught at a young age to go with your gut? I, I think that depends. I think that depends on who teaches you, but sure, there are, um, like I said, this one's intransigent um, as far as uh, its pervasiveness and movability in our in our culture in in western culture is that our gut has this is a sixth sense okay so but statistically and you know we don't we don't think statistically so oh well, who cares about statistics um but statistically it's better to change your answer uh, so what is the issue? Well, uh, I don't want that to play. Okay, cool. So the first one, a uh, video will be coming up in just a, uh, just a second. Uh, I like the why incompetent people think they're amazing. We'll, we'll get to that. Don't worry. Uh, so unrealistic optimism. Uh, for the most part, humans are optimistic. We like to think that things are going to be looking up. Now, that is not to say that some people aren't pessimistic and things are always looking down. Uh, but for many people, optimism is just the orientation of life. Things are going to be look. Things are looking up. Things can only go up from here, right? Uh, if I'm doing this test and I think I know the right answer, then it's probably right. It's fine. We'll, we'll be fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Um, and then as, as a subpopulation, students who are doing a multiple choice test, um, if you ask students, if I give you 50 questions on a multiple choice test, how many do you think you'll get right? It's a subject you know. Okay, It's a subject you've been studying. That, uh, th uh, this is uh, a real methodology, by the way. So you ask students um, in a subject they, they've been studying, in a subject they know, I'm going to ask you 50 questions. How many out of 50 will you get right? Uh, and um, many will say, like, oh, you know, 45, 47, 48, 50. And you compare that with what their actual answers are. 37, 42. You know, and you get, so you'll get this, this a bit of a disparity there. And so before we engage in the activity, we think we're going to do better than we, we already do. Um, also in this subgroup, students, the concept of metacognitive or metacognition, that is knowing what you know being able to think about your thinking okay that's what metacognition is cognition about cognition 
And so students tend to be metacognitively blind, okay? So we already talked about over-optimism on skills, but then as well as abilities and level of performance. So the first choice, I'm going to go with my first choice because I think that's right. That's the right answer. The other more sinister piece is what's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect has gotten a lot of play over the last uh, four years, for sure, four or five years, um, because of, of various people in our government uh, here in the United States. So the idea about the Dunning-Kruger effect is that it is the idea that the less I know about something, the more confident that I feel that I do know it and will have more confidence than to share that. In other words, why an incompetent person might think they're amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video here for you. <laughs> Hmm. So this is from Ted Ed. Good source. Are you as good at things as you think you are? How good are you at managing money? What about reading people's emotions? How healthy are you compared to other people you know? Are you better than average at grammar? Knowing how competent we are and how our skills stack up against other people's is more than a self-esteem boost. It helps us figure out when we can forge ahead on our own decisions and instincts, and when we need instead to seek out advice. But psychological research suggests that we're not very good at evaluating ourselves accurately. In fact, we frequently overestimate our own abilities. Researchers have a name for this phenomenon, the Dunning-Kruger effect. This effect explains why more than a hundred studies have shown that people display illusory superiority. We judge ourselves as better than others to a degree that violates the laws of math. When software engineers at two companies were asked to rate their performance, 32% of the engineers at one company and 42% at the other put themselves in the top 5%. That's not possible. In another study, 88% of American drivers describe themselves as having above average driving skills. Also not possible. These aren't isolated findings. On average, people tend to rate themselves better than most in disciplines ranging from health, leadership skills, ethics, and beyond. What's particularly interesting is that those with the least ability are often the most likely to overrate their skills to the greatest extent. People measurably poor at logical reasoning, grammar, financial knowledge, math, emotional intelligence, running medical lab tests, and chess all tend to rate their expertise almost as favorably as actual experts do. So That's not good. who's most vulnerable to this delusion? Sadly, all of us, because we all have pockets of incompetence we don't recognize. But why? When psychologists Dunning and Kruger first described the effect in 1999, they argued that people lacking knowledge and skill in particular areas suffer a double curse. First, they make mistakes and reach poor decisions. But second, those same knowledge gaps also prevent them from catching their errors. In other words, poor performers lack the very expertise needed to recognize how badly they're doing. For example, when the researchers studied participants in a college debate tournament, the bottom 25% of teams in preliminary rounds lost nearly four out of every five matches. But they thought they were winning almost 60%. Without a strong grasp of the rules of debate, the students simply couldn't recognize when or how often their arguments broke down. The Dunning-Kruger effect isn't a question of ego blinding us to our weaknesses. People usually do admit their deficits once they can spot them. In one study, students who had initially done badly on a logic quiz and then took a mini course on logic were quite willing to label their original performances as awful. 
That may be why people with a moderate amount of experience or expertise often have less confidence in their abilities. They know enough to know that there's a lot they don't know. Meanwhile, experts tend to be aware of just how knowledgeable they are, but they often make a different mistake. They assume that everyone else is knowledgeable too. The result is that people, whether they're inept or highly skilled, are often caught in a bubble of inaccurate self-perception. When they're unskilled, they can't see their own faults. When they're exceptionally competent, they don't perceive how unusual their abilities are. So if the Dunning-Kruger effect is invisible to those experiencing it, what can you do to find out how good you actually are at various things? First, ask for feedback from other people and consider it even if it's hard to hear. Second, and more important, keep learning. The more knowledgeable we become, the less likely we are to have invisible holes in our competence. Perhaps it all boils down to that old proverb, when arguing with a fool, first make sure the other person isn't doing the same thing. Did you enjoy this lesson? If so, please consider supporting our nonprofit mission by visiting patreon.com slash ted-ed. Alrighty. Ah, oh, so that is the Dunning-Kruger effect, and it ends up, uh, you can plot it on a kind of a curve of, of, um, perception and knowledge, um, which is then why you can get, uh, experts and highly competent people, um, to fall prey to that second part of not understanding that, um, not everyone has your expertise, right? And this is not, the, the Dunning-Kruger effect applies to every single domain of knowledge. So even if this is some sort of physical activity, like you know a sport, um, you know how to, you know, you know how to physically play a sport, uh, it applies to, you know, traditional uh, um, abilities in, in the academic world, like reading, writing, and and the math that sort of thing so this applies to everything okay this applies to everything uh all right now reason number two people do not switch there we go memory for failures versus successes so this is an evolutionary reason for why we don't change our answers on on multiple choice tests or we feel more confident um, um to stay rather than switch because we actually remember our failures way more and with way more detail and vividness than um our successes and this can translate to a multiple choice test here if you change your answer from right to wrong, you are going to remember that failure versus then changing wrong to right, which is a success more often because we remember our failures and that is evolutionary. We do it. We remember our failures because if we escaped with our lives, then we know not to do that thing again. If we're like, oh, I was inches from death, then you're not going to do it again. Uh, and so our ancestors, you know, hardwired that memory for failures so we would survive, you know. Um, don't light flint in your face, you know, lest you get sparks in your eyes or something like that, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, Maddie, it is it is a uh, factor in depression because you get you get sucked into a vicious um, cognitive cycle of ruminating about negative things yeah so and and you then start thinking about those negative things and memory for the failures versus successes yeah for sure depression um is, is connected the memory for failures is useful i'm not saying it's a bad thing i'm i'm saying it's useful the depression obviously not so much um, useful and is 
mostly a bad thing. Um, but we don't remember our successes because successes tend to be shorter lived. Okay. They tend to be shorter lived. We don't need to remember if we achieved victory in that case because um, our life wasn't in jeopardy. Your genes, all they care about is, pro is, is recreating themselves. Okay, so things that have survival value are going to be remembered best. Yeah, sure. Some successes are remembered, like how to kill a um, how to kill a mastodon, for example, um, big giant woolly mammoth or whatever. And remembering that is pretty crucial. Um, but uh, before that was learned, a lot of failures about how to kill a woolly mammoth were remembered. Okay. So that has um, uh, extreme value. We don't want to be wrong. Um, we don't like it. And uh, we don't want to fail. Uh, and so we try to avoid it. Okay. Now, personality does interact with this memory for failure. So if you are a person who has low emotional stability, which used to be called neuroticism, and it's still kind of called neuroticism, um, a personality trait. Uh, so if you're high neurotic, low emotional stability, then um, memory for failure is going to be higher. Uh, and memory for success is going to be lower. Okay, And again, connection with uh, mental health challenges like depression of course. The third reason why we don't change our answers is the uh, availability heuristic. So earlier in the semester, I showed the summer of the shark, uh, uh, what, what, uh, the piece, the Stephen Colbert piece, sub summer of the shark, um, and then it was the summer of the coconut, and then it was the summer of the stairs, and it was the summer of the bathtubs. And then it was the summer of um, uh, raw pineapple and sometimes strawberries, I think is what it was. And then it was the summer of everything, right? Uh, so this is that was the availability heuristic that we talked about, okay? So this is when you remember things that you think um, are more frequent because they're more easily remembered, right? And so... Uh, um, how, uh, what was the, the how, more deaths due to breast cancer in women because, you know, we, we spend more time talking about breast cancer. It's got, you know, October is breast cancer month. We're in central Illinois where Susan G. Komen was from. Um, so there's, you know, the, there's a big thing about breast cancer, but, you know, heart disease actually kills more women every year significantly more women than every uh, every year uh another uh way to think about the availability heuristic is um you know red cars and speeding tickets we were ta we talked about that so that's another reason why we don't change our first impulse decision um because our first impulse decision is more available to us we go with that one because it's easy to think about it's easier to think about um, and so if you, on a multiple choice test, if you see something that you recognize, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to go with that one. And that might be the wrong, that's probably the wrong answer. Um, unless you're knowledgeable. Okay. Fourth reason. Fourth reason we don't change our answers is the desire to avoid regret. We don't want to fail. And we don't want to regret that we failed or made a bad decision. So we behave against our own interests as a means to avoid that regret. Okay, right? our goal on this test or uh, in the game show is to perform well or win or, you know, whatever, be successful. And so, but what if that doesn't happen? But what if, but what if? But what if, what if, right? We don't want to do that. And so 
We don't change our answer. Um, this would be classified under the term irrational from a psychological sense. Um, not how you would use irrational in your um, normal day-to-day -day conversations, uh, but this would be psychologically irrational because you are actually doing something against your goals and interests, okay? Um, and I liken this to um, a, a time gone by when there were actually, like, lines at grocery stores, you know, because people were out shopping and you know, being members of society and that sort of thing, you know, thousands of years ago um, when that was the case. It feels like it's been so long, um, you know, in the good old days when you were standing in line and um, you thought it was moving faster. Uh, so you were standing in a line. Sorry, the, the phrase isn't as, as clear as I, as I hoped it to be. You're standing in a line, you look over to the next line and you're like, Oh, that move, that's moving faster. So you move. So you give up your initial line and you move to the other line. And then you're stuck behind that, what you perceive to be fast line. And you're like, oh, why didn't I stay? Again, not a good, not a terribly good analogy, but the feeling is what I'm focusing on here. It's not supposed to correspond with the first impulse. Obviously, it's a first impulse thing. You could consider this one as I'm switching lines. It's the feeling of regret. So if you are ever in a line and you're like, oh, that other line's moving quickly, I'm going to move. And then your line, you were, the line that you were initially in was solid. It was good. That feeling of regret of, oh, why did I move is what I'm focusing on there. We don't want to have that feeling. That feeling feels awful, doesn't it? Regret feels awful. It makes us feel like, crap okay so those are the four those are the four reasons why we um don't change our answers right so what's my moral of the story well my moral of the story is um entertain the idea i'm not saying always change your answer from your first instinct but Imagine being in a situation where you don't remember the answer or you don't remember the concept this question's asking and you're like, okay, my first impulse is this one. Hmm. Sit back and think about it. Don't leave it. Don't ignore it and then go move on to the next one. S give yourself uh, a second pass or a third pass. And see whether or not your first impulse was actually right. Okay. In practice, this one, this myth is the probably the hardest one uh, to break on a personal level. All the other myths that I've shared with you, I think you can change your beliefs um, rather easily and quickly and stop doing the things um, related to them. But this one, this one's really hard. And I'm not saying you should do it. You do you, obviously. You do you. But entertain the idea that... Uh, try to set aside for a moment your um, desire to avoid failure, your desire to avoid regret, and see if you get the right, right answer. Um, it's not always going to work in your favor. It's not a tried and true thing. And so if you are a risk-averse person, well, maybe you won't do it because it's too risky to change, okay? It's too risky to change. Um, if you are, so if you're uncertain, give it a think, right? Um, and you've all had the feeling of deja vu, right? Glitch in the matrix. Don't worry, you're not supposed to know, that's fine. Just a glitch in the world. Matrix? What's the Matrix? Uh, anyways, familiarity is sometimes... Um, I think we just got an email regarding... Yep. Um, we just got an email. The uh, Ashlyn, I think your question was answered. We are online for the remainder of the semester. 
um, we will not be um, we will not be well I mean I was trying not to be right I was hoping I wasn't gonna be right but yeah we are online for the rest of the semester um, which breaks my heart um, but um, you know y'all have to stay safe so evidence evidence has come out that even young adults can have severe severe infections from covid-19 and um, you know die so we we don't want we don't want that um so abundance of caution yeah um that's a bummer i'm sorry y'all i'm sorry uh, more information in the email that was just sent out by the college um, from Dr. Wright, uh, President Wright. So, um, yeah. Uh, more modifications coming to the syllabus in light of all of that. So um, we will not be watching um, the film. So that's a bit of a bummer. Um we will uh i'll i'll think of I'll, i'm gonna think of something else so yeah anyways that's the end of the class are there any questions about changing your uh your answers to the uh multiple choice test questions how many of you are going to um do this how many of you are gonna to do this uh, in um, in your in your life moving forward? Da, 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 da. Uh, and any last questions before um, we end with this material? Okay, oh, great. Good job, Christine. Let me know how it goes. Let me know how it goes. Either this semester or after. Send me an email. Yeah, guessing answers. This is only useful for guessing answers. Um, so, yeah, it's very 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 important if you know the answer and you're you're confident you know because you did the studying then this kind of doesn't this kind of doesn't work this kind of doesn't work or i mean it's not applicable i'll say it's not applicable um this is only if your first impulse is an intuitive one okay is an intuitive one. Oh boy So um, last bits of uh, just a reminder, uh, please email me if you participated in the peer review swap um, as soon as possible. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be doing grading this afternoon uh, and give me those questions for next Tuesday. Um, it's going to be fairly chill, um, fairly chill. Uh, come see if you're, you get the answer that you're looking for, the answer that you seek. I'm going to try my best. Uh, I'll try my best, of course. But yeah, that's what I plan on doing. Um, if there are any further questions regarding this material or class in general, please email me, message me. Um, that is totally fine. Uh, I will be going through, uh, the chat for credit today. If you have a username that, uh, <laughs> Uh, it's gonna t if you have a username that's not your name uh, or your last name, um, I'm gonna have to learn it. But yeah, definitely make sure that you are using your real name at the beginning of chat, so I can make sure that you get credit. So Kid Monkey, I don't remember who you said you were, but um, yes, th things like that. Uh, I know everybody's name in class, and I know everybody's first and last name, so that's not a big problem. But you know, Twitch, you can have whatever name you want. Like I'm Cogsafe. Pro Ah, yes, yeah, Sean. Very good. That's probably why I missed that. Um, so, yeah. 
Alrighty, everybody. Um, we end the stream a little bit early today, so um, you know, take a rest before your eleven o'clock class. Uh, and uh, Tyler, I did get you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good weekend in light of this new news. Um, and uh, good luck. I will see you all on Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday for grab bag psych. Toodle-dee.